Kicking off part four of chapter 23 of the digestive system in our human anatomy and physiology textbook. Um, this time we're going to be looking at the liver and the pancreas, those accessory organs of digestion, and how they're regulated by two of the enterogastrone hormones that we've already encountered. So first of all, the liver, it's a very large gland made up of four lobes. Anatomically, here you see only two of the lobes depicted here, but the liver has four lobes and it has a bile duct. One of its products, its product that, uh, that is most important in digestion is called bile. The bile, as we'll see, travels down through the bile duct to the gallbladder and the gallbladder stores that bile until mealtime, in which case um, a, um, a pterogastrone will come, a hormone will come and cause contraction of the gallbladder and shoot the bile down into the duodenum, the first part of the small intestine. The pancreas we see here also, the other accessory organ of today's uh, section, and the pancreas produces um, pancreatic juice of two important compositions, two important constituencies, and it travels through this duct also into the duodenum under control of hormones. Anyway, back to the liver. <clears throat> the liver is made up of lobules. So it's a whole bunch of different lobules. The lobule is kind of like the smallest functional unit of the liver, and each lobule is like a hexagonal arrangement of sets of three tubules around a large central vein. And so we're going to take a look at a, at a schematic diagram that kind of shows what that lobule looks like and what's a portal triad. Those three tubules, incidentally, represent a arterial coming from the hepatic artery, a venial coming from the hepatic portal vein, and a small duct uh, that's beginning this process of, of delivering uh, bile into the intestine. <clears throat> well, all of the portal triads associate in some way with the capillaries of the liver. Those are called sinusoids. So when blood, for example, flows through the hepatic portal vein into these venules as part of the triad, it moves along through the sinusoidal capillaries uh, coming in contact with the hepatic cells. Hepatocytes just means liver cells, and they're arranged kind of in plates. I'll show you in a second. Um, also, those sinusoids have lots of macrophages that are fixed macrophages. They stay in the liver. They're called Kupfer cells, and those are the those are the macrophages we've been talking about many times that purge things out of the blood, such as complement-coated uh, antigens, opsonized antigens gobbled up by Kupfer cells. Hunks of fibrin during during fibrinolysis, uh, as we break down um, blood clots, uh, any kind of debris, dead bacteria, and so forth. Anything that's in the in the, in the circulation that is debris will be cleared by the by the Kupfer cells. Old, worn red blood cells. Yes, the spleen and the liver recycle those red blood cells. All right. So here's a beautiful diagram of a of a lobule of the liver. So all these um, square things are those are the hepatocytes, the cells of the liver that do all the metabolic hijinks. And surrounding this, this sort of block of liver cells or hepatocytes are these uh, portal triads. And each one of the triads, again, has a portal arterial, a portal venule, and a bile duct. Just to remind you, all of the blood from the esophagus, stomach, small intestine, large intestine, and spleen are collected together into one large vein called the portal vein, the hepatic portal vein, and it all goes straight to the liver for processing. And then, once that blood's been processed by the liver, it travels into the hepatic vein and back to the vena cava. So that's what's in the hepatic portal vein, all that blood coming from the digestive tract. And it's going to come into the, to the lobule around the perimeter in these hepatic venules, and it's going to percolate through the sinusoidal capillaries, uh, coming in contact with these plates of hepatocytes. And the hepatocytes are going to remove toxic agents and medicines and various things. Debris, excuse me, debris of all kinds. And, and at the same time, the liver is going to produce bile that's going to travel the opposite way into these bile ducts, which will then be sent into the duodenum. 
<clears throat> so the patocytes again have all these different functions that we started to note. They they process bloodborne nutrients. For example, glucose is going to be stored in the liver as glycogen. The liver can convert glucose into fatty acids to be sent to the adipose tissue for storage. The liver can store some fat-soluble vitamins. They can also um, partition into the fat in our body. Um, this liver is the, is the sort of center for controlling lipid metabolism. The, the liver receives all of the lipids from your diet in the form of chylomicrons that enter the lymphatic system from your digestive tract. They go then into the venous blood and then straight to the liver. Chylomicrons are taken up by the liver, and the liver then sends out other lipoproteins to deliver um, triglycerides and cholesterol to all the cells of your body as needed. So lipid metabolism. The liver removes a lot of toxins and, and chemicals from your blood that come from your diet or from your medications, and the liver produces bile. One last thing I didn't mention before, which is really important, the liver has the job of removing catecholamines from the circulation, norepinephrine and epinephrine. When you activate the sympathetic nervous system, it takes about a half an hour for, the, for it to settle back down. And part of that is because the liver has to uh, remove those catecholamines from the circulation and destroy them by the action of these two enzymes, catechol-O-methyltransferase and monoamine oxidase. Those are two enzymes that will help us get rid of catecholamines, and then eventually the things can settle back down to resting levels. Another cool thing about the liver is it's highly regenerative. Um, <clears throat> it can remove up to 80% of the liver, it's estimated, and it will regenerate itself back to essentially its original capacity. That's pretty astonishing. Um, we've talked about the regenerative capacity of different tissues and been kind of thinking about that all along since way back in Chapter 4. Uh, here's a majorly regenerative tissue. Wow. You can also transplant tissue into someone else's body, and it will regenerate a functioning liver. It takes some, a good amount of liver tissue from one person's body and transplant it into another. Um, that produces liver for them. So this is a transplant, unlike other organs like kidneys, where you transplant the entire organ, in this case, you just transplant a part of the organ. The, the donor still has its liver. The recipient will then grow a liver. And we have a very effective um, process going on there. <clears throat> if you get inflammation in your liver, that's called hepatitis. That's the definition of hepatitis. But usually when we say hepatitis, we're talking about a viral infection with one of any of five uh, hepatitis viruses. But there's other things that can cause hepatitis or inflammation. Certain drugs cause tac toxicity in the liver. If you eat about 200 um, Tylenols, you'll have some major toxicity in the liver. Certain um, toxins from, from wild mushrooms can cause poisoning in the liver and hepatitis. But usually we mean viral hepatitis. But that's the correct way to say it, viral hepatitis. Um, if, the hep if, the, if the liver is subject to chronic inflammation, either through alcohol consumption or abuse, or by uh, hepatitis viruses, eventually the liver will be destroyed and will have a condition called cirrhosis in which many of the hepatocytes have been converted to collagen fibers and fat. So with cirrhosis, the liver has very little of its original metabolic capability left, but it's very stiff and hard and, and, um, and is very resistant to blood flow. Unfortunately, it's very hard to push the blood to the liver from all the, the intestines and, and the stomach and the spleen, that so-called splanchnic circulation. Well, once you have cirrhosis, it's very hard to push the blood through there. So what happens? Blood backs up into the veins of all those organs and bulges out and eventually may cause burst blood vessels that leak into the GI tract and cause uh, chronic bleeding and um, anemias, and possibly even death due to poisoning because of excess amounts of protein in the form of, of uh, hemoglobin and plasma proteins being delivered to the digestive tract. So anyway, that's called portal hypertension. If your liver becomes too stiff and hard and the resistance is high and the blood backs up into the, into the portal vein and then into the veins of those organs, the, the intestines and stomach and the esophagus, you have portal hypertension. 
perfect. <clears throat> gallstones, the gallbladder stores bile, and it just remains in there until mealtime when a particular hormone is going to come out and cause contraction of the, of, the, of, the, of the gallbladder and shoot the bile into the duodenum. Well, sometimes precipitates form in the, in the gallbladder, hard, super hard precipitates called calculi, biliary calculi, and they're composed of cholesterol and bile salts, actually mainly cholesterol and phosphate and calcium. And uh, it forms a hard, these hard so-called stones. And then when the gallbladder contracts, it causes very great discomfort. So that every time you eat a meal when you have gallstones, it's very, very uncomfortable. So eventually the, um, the gallbladder may be removed. It's the most common elective surgery uh, of all to remove the gallbladder and people that have gallstones. There are other ways to sort of break down the stones if they're not too big. You can clear out the, using ultrasound, for example, you can clear out the gallstone, perhaps. All right. <clears throat> Let's talk briefly about the pancreas, and then we'll go back to um, looking at the regulation of these two organs. Um, <clears throat> the pancreas produces two secretions. It produces di digestive enzymes that can break down all of the macromolecules in your entire diet. Proteases break down proteins. Amylases that break down starch. Nucleases that break down uh, um, nucleic acids, DNA and RNA. And lipases that break down fat into fatty acids and glycerol. So those are all the digestive enzymes that you need. There are already other sources of some of the digestive enzymes, but the, the liver produces digestive enzymes. They are tr Their release is triggered by cholecystokinin, right? It comes from the duodenum when the duodenum experiences the influx of proteinaceous and fat-rich chyme from the stomach that causes cholecystokinin or CCK to come out. CCK feeds back and inhibits the stomach, as we said, but it feeds forward and activates the, the pancreas to release all these digestive enzymes. Incidentally, they're released in zymogen form enzyme that's a zymogen is inactive and then uh, it'll become active activated in the small intestine the other big thing that the pancreas creates the other the other comp component of its of its pancreatic juice is bicarbonate ion so the, the the job of the pancreas is to neutralize all of the acid that came from the stomach right the stomach acidifies its, its contents passes that chyme right down into the duodenum and the, and the pancreas produces a whole bunch of bicarbonate ion to exactly neutralize that stomach acid uh, by the, you know, the two can combine to form carbonic acid and dissociate into CO2 and water. So um, what causes that to come out? Secretin. Secretin is released from enteroendocrine cells in the duodenum uh, when, the, when the acidic chyme arrives in the duodenum. So acidification causes secretin to come out. What does it do? Feeds back and inhibits the stomach but it feeds forward and causes the pancreas to release bicarbonate-rich juice that will neutralize that acid. <clears throat> so yeah, what are we talking about here? The parietal cells of the stomach produce carbonic acid by the action of carbonic and hydrase, and they pump the hydrogen ions into the stomach to produce acid, and they, they put bicarbonate ions into the blood, the alkaline tie. The pancreatic duct cells are exactly the reverse. They do the exact same thing in the opposite direction. They form carbonic acid and then dissociate that, and they pump the bicarbonate ion into the lumen, into the duct, and then into the duodenum to neutralize all the acid coming from the stomach. And they pump the hydrogen ions into the blood to um, neutralize all the bicarbonate ion that came from the pancreas, or came from the stomach, I'm sorry, when it was making its stomach acids. We neutralize the chyme in the digestive tract and we neutralize the plasma by the by action of the pancreas. <clears throat> There's a little diagram showing that uh, one acinus, the acinus is a secretory unit of, of um, exocrine nature. These are all uh, simple columnar epithelial cells that produce the digestive enzymes. And this, each one of these are called an acinar cell because this is a secretory acinus. Funny kind of term, sounding terms. The duct cells produce the bicarbonate rich fluid. And so the CCK activates these acinar cells and secretin 
activates those duct cells. So here's another uh, way of um, illustrating the action of the, of the pancreatic duct cells. They produce carbonic acid, dissociate that into bicarbonate carbonate ion, which they pump into the lumen of the duodenum to neutralize the stomach acid, and they pump hydrogen ions into the blood to neutralize the uh, bicarbonate that came from the, from the parietal cells of the stomach. The, um, the digestive enzymes that the pancreas produce, produces come into the, into the duodenum in inactive form, zymogen form. You see the suffix O-G-E-N, trypsinogen, chymotrypsinogen, and part carboxytryptases. Um, they're inactive. And then what happens is there's a, an enzyme in the brush border, the microvilli of the epithelial cells here, that can uh, activate all these hormones, or, sorry, all these enzymes. The way that works is the very first uh, enzyme in the list here, trypsin, for trypsinogen, is activated by enteropeptidase in the membrane of these cells in the brush border to form trypsin, and the activated trypsin then converts chymotrypsinogen to, to uh, trypsinogen. Uh, carboxypeptidases become activated. All the enzymes become activated by trypsin. <clears throat> so here's a nice little diagram showing you the action of those hormones secretin and cholecystokinin um, in respect to controlling um, the pancreas and the liver. So right chyme comes down from the stomach into the duodenum. CCK, shown as little red dots, and secretin, shown as yellow dots, are secreted by these enteroendocrine cells, and they travel in the bloodstream, and they affect the pancreas. We said that CCK will come to the pancreas and cause it to release enzyme-rich juice, and secretin will come to the pancreas and cause it to release bicarbonate-rich juice. Also, bile salts are, are going to stimulate the, the liver to produce bile, but mostly secretin. So the C, sorry, we'll pause there. Secretin and CCK continue on their journey to the liver, and secretin causes the liver to secrete bile, and CCK causes the gallbladder to contract and shoot the bile down into the duodenum. So um, those two hormones activate the two secretions of the pancreas, and those two hormones uh, cause the liver to make bile and, and uh, cause the, the gallbladder to contract. So now we have those two accessory organs working uh, full time to get us the help we need with digestion. All right. Join me next time, and <clears throat> we'll look at the digestive processes in the small large intestine.